from a singular idea, from a child, from a woman, from a man, from a community. At first, it may seem as though it's not going to take root. Uh, it's like the parable of the sower. The dreamer has to be discerning in what seeds you plant and whether or not you're planting the seed in fertile ground. And not among weeds, that's the other thing, because we know weeds will choke out the seed. If you plant it on rocks, we know that if there is rain, it's going to wash off the seed. In the work we do to end hunger, fertile ground is really important. And the work that Art Simon did in planting bread for the world on fertile ground is the reason why I'm able to be here speaking to you 50 years later. So Bread for the World's Policy and Research Institute, where I sit, we basically are the think tank within the organization. Yes, Red is a faith-based organization, but we ground our policy work on data. We subscribe to the power of numbers, the power of data, to really help drive good policies and discourse around ending the issue of hunger. And we've been doing this, the Policy and Research Institute has been in existence since 1975. We build on our work uh, through consultations with partners, information sharing, and also collaboration with different folks, both in the US and across the globe. As I mentioned, you know, I feel that my voice to work to end hunger is a lot in part because of people who've come before me. I am a beneficiary of voices that sought to end hunger decades before I was born. And so you see the impact of one voice can really reverberate uh, across generations towards ending hunger. And I would argue towards addressing other social issues that we have. It is my hope that our conversation this evening will inspire more voices, uh, that those voices then will in turn inspire other voices. So I'm gonna start our conversation with the 1967 Nigerian Civil War where a famine was declared uh, and some of the musings of my parents uh, about the war and its impact on their friends as they were coming of age and they were in college during that era. Then I'll try my best to talk a bit about the 1972 and 1975. During that era, Red for the World was founded, as well as there was a hunger crisis. There were multiple famines happening in the world. At the same time, there was a declaration that was uh, created in the UN, which was the right to food in response to the hunger crisis that was going on. I would be remiss not to mention 1984, where there was a, a famine in Ethiopia. And some folks may have seen on Netflix, there's a Netflix original with Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, where they sang the song, We Are the World. They were raising money to address the famine that was happening in, in Ethiopia, which unfortunately claimed, as according to experts, 300,000 to a million people died from hunger. And then I'm going to talk a bit about my work as a humanitarian worker at the World Food Program. I'll talk about how we use technology and innovation to get young people excited about ending hunger. Uh, and we were focused on the four famines of 2017 in Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and northeastern Nigeria. Then I'm going to zoom into 2024, our present day, where every time you wake up, you turn on the news, there's something about hunger and malnutrition and despair and just pain and suffering of people across the globe. So before I begin, though, I think it's important to provide some context, uh, some definitions, uh, so that, you know, uh, during the Q&A session, you're, you all are able to ask me questions and also push my ideas uh, and challenge my thinking. So what is food insecurity? A person is food insecure when they lack the regular access to enough safe and nutritious food for normal growth and development and an active life. So you could be in Galveston, you could be in Sacramento, California, you could be anywhere in the world uh, and meet that definition of food insecurity according to the UN. What is famine? Famine is an extreme deprivation of food. That is starvation that we see on the news, death, 
this destitution and extreme levels of acute malnutrition where you see the physical manifestations of someone not having had access to food. So that is what famine means according to the UN. Uh, you don't have to be a scientist to actually know that there's famine-like conditions when you see people who are exposed to famine because they look physically as though they haven't had access to food. And what is a global food crisis? What is happening in Ukraine and Russia and its impact on food prices is the definition of a global food crisis. So a lot of people may or may not know that Russia and Ukraine are bread baskets of the world. And unfortunately, uh, the war hasn't only caused problems for civilians, but it has also impacted the livelihoods of farmers who are helping to produce as the world's bread basket, their livelihoods, and that's impacting the prices of tomatoes and other things that we are buying in the supermarket. It's impacting uh, the prices of food for us. So that's what a global food crisis is. What is a hunger hotspot? So according to the UN, they put out this report uh, on basically 18 countries that are impacted by hunger due to three or four categories, climate, conflict, economic inequality, and you know, I would say the fourth one is political tepidity, where there isn't a political will to really address uh, the issue of hunger. So for example, in the period of April 2023 through, uh, uh, the, in the period ending in April 2023, there were 22 hunger hotspots, but 18 countries. So they lumped together the Sahel region of Africa as sort of representing one country. And then they, they lumped together the dry corridor in our backyard as one country, basically sort of like one region of the country. So that's how they end up with 18 hunger hotspots. But in reality, there are actually 22 countries uh, that are impacted. And you know some of those countries include Burkina Faso, Mali, South Sudan, uh, Sudan. Palestine was added uh, to the list of countries of highest concerns in light of everything that we've seen on the news. Uh, Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Haiti, uh, Pakistan, Somalia, the Syrian Arab Republic, Yemen, Chad, Djibouti, Niger, and then in our backyard, we have El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, these countries remain uh, hunger hotspots. So experts note, though, that even though these countries are hunger hotspots, they believe that there are solutions. So they're not just saying the world is ending, let's just give up, let's not do anything. They believe that having country-specific recommendations will really help to move the needle as it relates to these emergency hunger hotspots, as well as planning ahead uh, when it comes to emergency situations. So in context where the hunger, the driver of hunger is climate, for instance, we have the technology to actually help us predict that there's gonna be a cyclone, there's gonna be a drought, there's gonna be a flood. So we are able to have anticipatory action to make sure that people don't lose their livelihoods. And then the other sort of big part of solutions is figuring out how we do this humanitarian development contact. Uh, humanitarian development uh, nexus is what experts call it, that is, Okay, so we know that there's a crisis. We know that people need food. We need to get them the food, like right now. But at the same time, how do we build infrastructure so that when the war is over, farmers are able to farm, they're able to uh, 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 reap their crops, they're able to help grow the local economy. And there's always that tension because on the one hand, we want to firefight, but then we also need to, we, have, we need to invest in the longer term solutions. You all may have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these are commitments made by the United Nations uh, and they do it roughly around every 15 years. They have 17 Sustainable Development Goals that they focus on currently through 2030. Sustainable Development Goal 2 is Bread for the World's Mandate. It's the goal to end hunger. Uh, and we do it through partnerships because we realize that we cannot do it alone. Two more definitions, I promise, and then I'll get into the talk. What is displacement? 
Displacement is the forced movement or removal of a person or communities from their home or country as a result of conflict, natural disaster, or economic factors. Think about this for a moment. I love my home, I love my bed. Oh, it's so warm. <laughs> Why would anyone leave the comfort of their home to go to an unknown place they, where no one may speak their language, where may, they may not have a loved one? Um, I wouldn't do it, frankly, because I'd rather be in my home. My bed is really comfortable. I love cooking in my kitchen. I love entertaining my friends and loved ones. So it's, it takes a lot for someone to leave their home uh, and be fleeing for, for whatever reason. Uh, and then the last definition is humanitarian access. Uh, so this is something that I studied quite a bit, actually, when I was in law school. But really, it was all very theoretical, if I were to be honest with you. And the definition of humanitarian access has a new, a brand new meaning to me these days, you know, um, as I am doing my work at Bread for the World and then as I'm watching the news. But here is what it is. Humanitarian access is an international legal policy. So it's actually like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the law, right? Humanitarian access is the law under international humanitarian law. And basically it allows uh, people who are humanitarian workers to have access to people in need. So there is a UN uh, emergency coordinator and that person's role is to make sure that organizations that are wanting to help people in need are able to have access to those people in need. Some of the things that humanitarian um, assistance, allow, assistance allows is access to water, access to health, access to shelter, access to food, things that are very, very basic, things that we have and you know things that uh, some people, unfortunately, uh, may not have. And it's the strict compliance to these principles, which is I know that if I park on the red zone, my vehicle we get, will get towed. Uh, these, these guidelines, these things, these guardrails that really help to make sure that our society is functioning. Compliance is what really enables us to give back to people who are in need. And by the way, humanitarian access involves state and non-state actors. That is to say that uh, a non-state actor, that is someone who's not the government of a country, would respect the, the legal principle of humanitarian access. And so one of the things that, some of the things that underpin humanitarian access is that no matter what's going on when it comes to civilians, we, 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 we recognize their humanity. We have to be neutral. We have to be impartial. And we also have to uh, be independent in the way in which we deal with uh, civilian population. Okay, so now I'm gonna sort of start uh, our conversation around the civil war between Nigeria and the Republic of Biafra, which tragically claimed three million lives from around 1967 to 1970. Nigeria is a country that's located in the western coast of Africa. Nigeria is bordered to the north by Niger, to the east by Chad and Cameroon, to the south of the Gulf of Guinea of the Atlantic Ocean, and then to the west by Benin and is Africa's most populous country. One of my favorite things as a child actually was putting together the puzzles of the world. We had this thing where each country, and Madagascar was always like missing for some reason. You know, and I always like try to put it back where it belonged. So I really like to kind of understand the countries that are around a particular country because that also informs the, the, de the dealings and everything that's happening. Nigeria has a diverse geography with climates ranging from arid to humid. Um, I am Nigerian American, and you know I can attest to experiencing all of these weather conditions. Uh, you know, traveling uh, to Nigeria with my parents uh, to Lagos or Abuja um, uh, for weddings and so on. Reflecting its diversity, there are many ethnic groups and languages in, in Nigeria. So Yoruba, uh, which is you know a language that, thanks to my mother, I speak. Uh, which meant that I was able to speak with my 103-year-old grandma uh, who passed away last year uh, because of the fact that my mom always spoke uh, Yoruba to my siblings and I. Um, other languages include Igbo, Hausa, 
Edo, Ibiobio, T, and English. So English is the language of Nigeria's colonizers. Uh, you know, so you know, a lot of African countries were colonized, and so English is the colonizer's language. Uh, Nigeria is blessed with yummy cuisine across its ethnic lines and abundant natural resources, most notably uh, deposits of petroleum and natural gas. The federal capital is in Abuja, so Abuja is sort of like Washington, D.C., and the commercial capital is Lagos, so think of Lagos as New York, I guess, you know, with Wall Street and, and so on. Lagos used to be the former capital. Um, due to ethnic tensions related to inequity in political representation and jurisdiction over these resources that I mentioned, in May of 1967, Eastern leaders declared secession uh, of the Eastern region under the name of the Republic of Biafra. Uh, so basically what it, and of course the Nigerian government interpreted this as uh, some sort of, as an act of rebellion, right? So a, 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 you know, part of the country said, we don't want to be part of Nigeria anymore because we have our own nat natural resources and we want to be on our own. And legal scholars may argue that every person, every country, every community have the right to self-determination and there's no reason why people should be forced to be part of a country or a people that they do not identify with. And so what unfortunately happened is that uh, fighting broke out and then like literally a civil war ensued. Uh, the next two years marked heavy casualties among civilians who were perishing because of famine due to the Nigerian government's blockade of humanitarian access. So you notice that I harped on the definition of humanitarian access because 1967, they were using the term humanitarian access. In 2024, when you turn on the news, they're using the word humanitarian access. And basically it means, can we get food, medicine, water, et cetera, shelter to people who are in need? And so a peacekeeping attempts by the African Union were not successful. However, uh, Biafra, the Republic of Biafra was getting a lot of support from other African countries because of the fact that the population of Biafra was starving because of this blockade of humanitarian access. In 1967, my late dad was around 21 years old. Um, he's a, he was an extremely brilliant guy, um, and you know he he wanted to be a lot of things. Uh, you know, I love NASA because my dad has a thing for NASA. You know, he thought he would be an astronaut because he had a, a full scholarship, but then he decided to be a veterinary surgeon. Um, we, my dad and I, we love animals. So we had turtles, a parrot, dogs, poultry farm, fish pond, everything you can think of, you know, as far as animals are concerned. Um, and so, you know, he, um, he and my mother are from the Yoruba tribe. Uh, but because of intermarrying, uh, my grandmothers on both sides have some Fulani or Hausa and Guinean in that in their blood. So the war in Nigeria was between the Easterners and the Northerners. So uh, my two grandmothers were actually part Northerner, if you will. Uh, one of my grandfathers was also Bendel. So and Bendel was part of the Eastern uh, bloc that the Eastern. Uh, Easterners were claiming as part of Biafra. Uh, so this makes my family not unusual. I mean, you know, people fall in love, they marry whoever it is that they want to marry, but it just made us a little bit complicated within the history of Nigeria, particularly uh, as it relates to the civil war and how it continues to mark political and personal relationships in the country. The civil war is a very touchy subject for a lot of people for good reason, because so many lives uh, were lost and then on top of that, you know, speaking of the North, my dad attended and had most of his career in northern Nigeria. So he went to Amadevelo University in northern Nigeria. He schooled in the U.S. as well as in Europe uh, at Edinburgh and UC Davis. And then, you know, he ended up working for the, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture in Nigeria. And then he worked for a Nigerian president, etc. But he actually spent most of his career, like his formative years, in, the, in northern Nigeria. So he spoke Hausa, which is the northern, the dominant northern Nigerian uh, na uh, language uh, that's spoken. Uh, between 1967 and 1972, he, you know, he completed his studies, 
And then years after the war ended, maybe three years after the war ended, he met my mom in 73, and they got married, and then they moved to his first job, first station, in Kenjidan, which is, again, in north-central Nigeria. Interestingly, uh, my mother lived for a short while in Kano, which is in, in northern Nigeria, but ended up in, at the University of Nsuka, which is in eastern Nigeria. Uh, she studied to be uh, a midwife uh, and a nurse. So you see, the Nigerian Civil War was between the north, as I mentioned, where my dad spent most of his adult life, and then and also his career, and then the east, where my mom uh, spent most of her life as an adult. And she actually can speak the eastern language, so he understands the, and can speak the northern, and she understands and can speak the eastern language. So uh, my perspective of the war was very interesting from both my parents' perspective. Uh, so although my dad, you know, he raised concerns about human suffering, he was always irritated by us wasting food. He always says, take only what you can eat, you know, and so on. Um, but the voice that was loudest for me as it relates to this issue of the Nigerian Civil War was actually my mom. Her voice was informed, I think, based on the prox her proximity to those who, loved, those who she loved, her friends losing their loved ones by living, you know, when she was going to school in eastern Nigeria. For most people, you know, our parents have sometimes the loudest voice in our heads. Uh, for me, I love history, I love storytelling. And so I found myself really getting steeped into, um, uh, you know, my mom's uh, discussion of what has happened in history. Uh, I still get upset at my mom sometimes because when I call her and I want her to tell me a story, she's like, let me call you back. I'm like, mom, can you just like, you know, finish this story? Because I really enjoy, uh, you know, the history that, uh, uh, she shared with me. And, you know, I can say that, you know, the war clearly shaped her worldview and sort of how she viewed war and peace uh, and its impact on generation. I would say the key takeaway from her voice was that she sowed the seeds of compassion in my siblings and I. So we had, you know, compassion for people who didn't have, uh, just compassion in general. Uh, she never became a humanitarian worker, my mom, but has, you know, you know, she's always involved in her community, always helping others. Um, she used her voice, you know, to educate me about the Biafran War specific, specifically. Um, one of the things that she talked about that really sort of bothered me, you know, was kind of how people were not having access to the basic necessities. Uh, you know, she would recall stories of her Eastern friends uh, in college talking about how they loved uh, lo lost in their, their loved ones, so death, destruction, and hunger. Um, you know, she would talk about people having to eat grass. You know, as a young child, none of that really sort of made sense to me. Why would people have to eat grass, right? Because they don't have access to food. People having to eat um, uh, mud, drinking on safe water, uh, and living in dangerous conditions that expose them to the elements of nature. So, you know, think about living, you're not living in a camp, you're living outside and you're exposed to anything really and everything that could harm you if you're living outside. So without having access to food, water, and medicine and shelter. Um, during this man-made uh, famine, uh, people died from, you know, as I mentioned, disease uh, and starvation and probably also heartbreak from loss. Um, I, you know, I, I always say that actually the human body, uh, the, the human soul is, when the soul is impacted, it really can really, really impact the way that the body deals with stress. Like if the soul remains intact, you know, and you think about Nelson Mandela, he was imprisoned, but he kept his soul intact. And he was able to stay in prison for such a long time and he came out and he wasn't bitter. I mean, that's pretty remarkable because he was able to keep his soul intact, even though his body was in prison, right? One of the things that he did that I admired was he worked out every day. Uh, he jogged on the same spot, even though he had a very small cell. He basically ran on the same spot for numbers of hours or minutes per day, and he was very disciplined about that. And there's something about physical movement that really helps to help uh, the body deal with stress. But so the soul, you know, I was talking about the soul and how if the soul is 
harmed, it's really difficult. It's difficult to cope. It's, it's difficult to find hope. Uh, so the clear picture in my mind from what my mother uh, imparted on us as far as what her friends went through was that um, some of them felt a lot of heartache. Some of them were not able to get over the heartache because they lost a lot of loved ones. According to USAID archives, support for food assistance for Biafra came through the Office of Food for Peace, which is currently funded through the U.S. Farm Bill uh, and provides critical funding for the work that Bread for the World does. So I talked about how you know, we fight for policies. One of the policies we advocate for is actually the U.S. Farm Bill. The U.S. Farm Bill is a bill that's passed every five years and it impacts food security for you and I here in the U.S., as well as our trade activities, so whether or not countries are gonna trade in agricultural products with us, as well as our ability to help people in need. So the Farm Bill is a big deal, and that's one of the key pieces of legislation that Bread for the World makes sure that members of Congress pass and that the president signs into law. So now think about it. The Farm Bill, Food for Peace, which is part of the Farm Bill, is what helped provide food assistance to people during the Biafra Civil War. So the bags of rice, the bags of beans, the, the oil, everything that was shipped from the U.S. to Biafra really helped people uh, so that they don't lose their lives. From what the records reflect, um, in 1967, the Nigerian Red Cross was one of the organizations that was also helping uh, to make sure that people were getting food. The Catholic Relief Services was also helping. I say this to say that it takes a whole community to really make an impact in people's lives. Um, it's not just the UN. I know that when I worked for the UN, we, we relied heavily on the coordinating partners on the ground. So the Catholic Relief Services, the Red Crosses, you know, the, the, the uh, Doctors Without Borders, all of the uh, different NGOs that are doing remarkable work on the ground and make our work at the World Food Program possible. <coughs> According to USAID and State Department officials, as it relates to the efforts of humanitarian access in Biafra, they said, I quote, only a ceasefire will halt the starvation of an estimated five to six million in Biafra. Unfortunately, unfortunately, by the time the war ended, according to experts, three million people, half the population of Biafra had perished from famine-like situations. You know, I want to quote another U.S. government official, I quote, it is clear to me that the volume of food alone that was required was far beyond any logistical arrangement that would be feasible without a ceasefire uh, and direct access to the uh, Biafra people. See, the other thing is that, you know, in order to actually get food to people, you can't be shooting at the people. I don't want to get shot getting food to people. Uh, you know, you can't be harming the people who are trying to get food to people. Uh, and so, that was unfortunately the case uh, in, 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 in Biafra where uh, humanitarian access was just not feasible. As I end this section, I just wanna kind of leave you all with the, the, some, some thoughts to think about. The question remains who should have been more prom who should have been a more prominent voice in the public discourse on the importance of humanitarian access in Biafra? <clears throat> was that voice loud enough? Was it courageous? Was it courageous enough in time to save lives? So now I want to talk a little bit about Rome uh, and the 1974 World Food Conference. Uh, so I lived in Rome for about four years when I was at the World Food Program. And um, you know, I remember my dad saying, do you like it in Rome? Because you know, he lived in Rome, he worked for the UN as well as Dad, they have like the best pasta. You know, they have the best pasta in Rome. If you haven't been to Rome, I urge you to go because they have really good wine and uh, you know really good pasta. Um, yes, they do. <laughs> Thinking about it right now, it's making me hungry. Like Barna, they have the best food. So you know, let me tell you kind of a little bit about Rome. So Rome is, you know, as we call it, Roma, uh, is a historical city and it's the capital of Italy and it's located in the Italian peninsula near the Tiber River. Um, so if you've been to Rome, you may have seen like the Trastevere, there's a long river called Trastevere, and actually the, the, the Tiber River runs 
the Trastevere runs into the Tipper River. So it's really nice to kind of know that, wow, like this bridge that my friends and I kind of walk past every day runs into this like, you know, historical uh, river. Uh, Rome will always hold a special spot in my heart because it actually enabled me, because, you know, Rome is such a historical uh, city, you know, the buildings, the cobblestone that always messes up your high heel, the ability to park my smart car, my little box car in the alleyway and not get a ticket because that's just the way we do it in Rome. You know, those are all the things that, you know, I really loved about Rome, but just also the art and the architecture was really inspiring for me as a writer. And it really helped to facilitate my creative imagination. When I was working on my first book, A Seat at the Table for Women, Girls, and Movements, A Manifesto on Peace and Security. In that book, I talk about my observations and the importance of empowering women and girls in war and in peace. Uh, you know, so if you look at a lot of the wars that are happening here uh, in, in our world, uh, you ask, well, where are the ladies? <laughs> you know, where are the ladies when it comes to leadership? Um, you know, the, the, uh, the slide that you're looking at, there's a woman who's from Haiti, and she's really been speaking up about this issue of violence on women and girls in Haiti. And, you know, you can't help but wonder if women are provided a seat at the table um, uh, when it comes to leadership, how different our world will, you know, will look. You know, I'll tell you, at the airport today, I have to tell the story, I was in line for my Starbucks coffee, uh, myself and a, a young lady, and um, a guy just walked in front of us, and he just walked, and I was like, usually I would overlook it, but my flight was actually leaving, so I was like, excuse me, I was in line. He's like, well, I'm just getting a bottle of water. I'm like, I'm trying to get on my plane too. And I'm like, and, and, by, and I was like, and by the way, she's in line too, so you need to get back in line. And then the, the woman behind me was like, thank you. And it was a whole sort of um, moment there. But, you know, and I commented, I said, well, why is it that, you know, why were the two of us invisible uh, to him? You know, what made him think it's okay to just walk past us? And the, the Starbucks lady actually agreed. She was like, I was like, you know, why is it that women are invisible to men? And uh, she's like, you know, she's like, I know, right? So there was like, you know, a, a, a power moment going on there. But, you know, this blind spot that I think that, you know, I call it male gaze, the male gaze in my course that I teach at George Washington University in DC, uh, this sort of blind spot that we all have where for some reason, a whole sector of society is not enabled to really uh, exercise their leadership, I think it's a blind spot and I think that it's actually a loss for all of us. Um, I feel that our world probably will look different if we enabled more seats at the table uh, for women and girls. But anyway, when I travel to Rome, you know, I still see it as the eternal city uh, because for me it conjures the tensions of humanity. On the one hand, we have the inconvenience of the prophetic or spiritual power on what it is that is the right thing to do in war and peace. So, you know, by, just by virtue of the Catholic Church being in Rome, there's a, that spiritual element of the, the right thing to do, right? But then on the other hand, Rome as a political capital of Italy kind of, you know, uh, embodies that self-preservation, political, pragmatic, often convenient actions that we all take. That is not to take action because it's inconvenient to do the right thing. Um, and so, you know, I always sort of wonder, kind of, why is it that Rome conjures this emotion in me? Uh, so Italy is, and in case you're wondering, well, why are we talking about Rome? So we're talking about the 1974 World Food Conference, which happened in Rome. Uh, and Rome houses three main UN entities. The, the three main UN entities that focus on food security. So there's a food and agriculture organization they focus on policy, my dad worked for that. And then there's the UN World Food Program. They focus on delivering food aid, so you probably see them on the news all the time. In fact, David Beasley, is, he used to be the executive director of uh, the World Food Program. And he's there with his FAO, which is the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, counterpart. Uh, and they're uh, actually doing work around four famines, which I'll talk uh, about in a little bit. Uh, and then the third UN agency that has to do with food in Rome is the International Fund for Agricultural Development. So when you think about the World Bank, 
oftentimes people are thinking about the World Bank doing, I don't know, building bridges or doing infrastructure projects. But the World Bank actually has a pretty robust uh, uh, portfolio as it relates to agriculture as a development tool. So through this multilateral entity called the International Fund for Agricultural Development, they help to promote agriculture uh, as a tool to empower countries across the globe. So, so back to the, the World Food Conference, uh, the, World, the, the Conference on Hunger in 1974. One of the key things that came out of it in a nutshell was this human right to food, uh, you know, which is basically uh, that as individuals, as governments, and as non-governmental organizations, we all need to work together to make sure that people have this human right to food. And what does it mean? It's pretty much the definition the opposite of the definition of food insecurity, which is that um, the right to adequate food, making sure that the food you have access to is actually nutritious. Um, and then also understanding that it's not enough to just provide people with food. There also has to be the infrastructure, the institutions that help to promote food security. So how do we make sure that policymakers are empowered uh, in uh, passing good food policies, but also funding agencies and institutions that will help to promote food security. And then I think the third thing that came out of this right to food was the importance of uh, communities working together. And it, it's just, my grandmother told me stories of when they paid people with cowrie shells. I was like, wait, what, grandma, what? And she actually told the story of how there was a time when you just put your bananas by the street, and you put the calorie shells by it of how much it's worth, and then you go home. And so people will pass by, take, they're trying to get two bananas, they'll take the two bananas, and then they'll put the calorie, you know, they'll put the money down, they'll pay, and then the next customer will, you know, so that's kind of how they did trade, you know. Back in the day, I'm pretty sure when she was pretty young, and I mean, that just reflected a society where people, value each other, but I, the, the, the larger point here is that um, it's impossible for us not to work with each other as a society. Uh, every single person has their own God-given talent, and when we bring those talents to the table, that is really what makes the world uh, go around. So this issue of having communities work together uh, was a really big thing that uh, came out of this World Conference on Hunger. Um, so during the period of 1972 through 1975, uh, there was a severe crisis in the Sahel region of Africa. Uh, particularly, uh, I think about 2 million people lost their lives. Uh, and what happened basically was that the hunger crisis in the Sahel region cascaded to other parts of the world. So then we had uh, hunger crisis in Bangladesh, we had hunger crisis in the Soviet Union, and it just really cascaded. And so this issue of famine in these different continents, different parts of the world, triggered the UN to say, we need to have a, a convening to really try to address this issue of food insecurity uh, and famine in the world. But I just wanna kind of pivot a little bit uh, on some of the things that happened during that world food uh, convening. Sometimes the greatest happenings in history are a footnote or not even mentioned in memorialized documents. So for me, as a researcher, you know, when I'm reading documents, I'm always asking my question, myself this question, who else needs to be here? Who's, who else's story is not being told? Uh, it's really important as students of history to be intellectually honest. Uh, and it's also important to ask yourself, what is missing? Uh, what are the dangers of excluding other voices? And what is the danger of a single story? Because what happens is that you get, you know, a perspective. You know, even when you read the Bible, for instance, you read the apostles write the different versions of what happened, and you see sometimes inconsistencies, in inconsistencies, right? So I read the Bible with a very critical eye. You know, uh, when I see a sexist statement, I'm like, wait a minute, like who's saying this, and why are they saying this? You know, not just take things for uh, face value, because also understanding that yes. God used people to speak to the world, but these are also human who have their own flaws and the way in which uh, they see the world. 
one of the things that I wanted to point out is that during the World Conference on Hunger, uh, there was an agenda related to the participation of African countries. Um, you know, at that time, a lot of African countries were achieving independence from colonial powers, uh, sometimes by force, uh, and this caused a lot of uh, economic challenges for African countries. So there was an agenda item on food aid to victims of colonial wars in Africa. That was actually an agenda item. I was like, wow, that is like so progressive, you know, that that was acknowledged. Um, and, you know, I think what it, what it was trying to, I think, reflect was that it's important for us to acknowledge the historical harms that the continent of Africa has endured as it relates to the issue of, as it relates to a lot of issues, but in this context, as it relates to the issue of hunger. So when you turn on the news and it seems like everyone that's hungry is African is African, you have to understand that this is a country, that, or excuse me, this is a continent that endured transatlantic uh, slave trade in the 17 and 1800s, and then there was the carving up of the different nations uh, and naming those nations uh, sort of at the whim of colonial powers. And then there was like the colonization project. And so cumulatively, these sort of historically traumatic events, according to reports, actually have impacted uh, people of African descent in ways in which we may not really fully be able to grasp. And, and, and some have argued that, uh, you know, in ways in which warrants uh, centuries of studying, uh, keeping in mind neuroplasticity, I, I really do subscribe to the fact that protracted trauma can alter the way in which a people behave, the way in which a people see themselves, the way in which a people are able to cope with stress and trauma. Um, and so just thought that it's important to sort of, you know, give us this context to understand why it seems like, you know, when we, when we look at hunger and the face of hunger, it seems to, you know, constantly emanate uh, from the continent of Africa. So, you know, I say that to say that it's important to sort of, you know, understand that, um, you know, to know our history or to fully appreciate what's happening, we have to, you know, grapple with history. Um, so I kind of want to round up here because I want to be respectful of time on the section on uh, the, the conference on hunger. The conference agenda for me reflected a need for a comprehensive approach to taking on this existential issue of, of hunger. Um, and, you know, as a woman of faith, sometimes when I say the word famine, uh, from a historical and spiritual perspective, the images that come to my mind pertain to the seven years of plenty in the Bible and the seven years of, you know, famine uh, as it relates to Joseph. So Genesis 3750 is truly a remarkable story of betrayal, which culminates in, you know, a once prideful Joseph. Uh, you know, and I think that some of us, when we're younger, you know, it's, it's, it's youthful uh, sort of attitude to think that we are invincible, you know, and, you know, Joseph had a prideful approach to life at, at a very young age, um, which, you know, put him in danger uh, with his brothers. But, uh, you know, he basically was positioned to save his family and the world from hunger through his obedience to God, speaking through Pharaoh and his dreams. So through Joseph's trials and tribulations, from being sold into slavery by his big brothers, who, by the way, were supposed to be looking out for him, uh, to being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and even being forgotten by the cupbearer. Because remember, the cupbearer, once he made it to the palace, he's like, peace out, Joseph. You know, I'm out of the prison. I'll see you later. Um, and, you know, I feel like these instances really were kind of reflective of a, a famine in his life. You know, Joseph had a true famine where people that he helped, people who were supposed to be looking out for him, were turning their backs on him. However, his personal famine ended when he continued to use his voice. So back to this issue of using your voice, no matter where you find yourself using your voice, he kept interpreting dreams, he kept interpreting dreams, and then somehow Sarah had a dream and the cupbearer suddenly remembered Joseph and they brought Joseph to the palace and the rest is history as we know it because Joseph was able to interpret the uh, Pharaoh's dream, he came second in command, he was able to then advise the king that they should store food so that they could plan for the future. And then it ends up, you know, there ends up being a famine which brings his brothers to Egypt, which reunites him with his family, 
and also saves his family from dying from famine, and helps Egypt become an economic powerhouse. This power of his voice, right? His voice was his dream, his ability to, to, to interpret dreams. He could have said, you know what, it's not worth it. Um, you know, I'm in this situation, I've been in, in, in a situation where I've been taken advantage of, I'm not gonna help others. But because of his voice, not only was he able to help others, but he was also able to be positioned uh, to make an impact in the world. Um, and I want to draw upon Brett's founder. You know, he talked about how during World War II, Art Simon, Reverend Art Simon, he talked about during World War II, um, he was inspired by his dad um, and how, you know, he could make an impact in people's life, lives. He writes, he writes about his father speaking against the proliferation of anti-Japanese sentiment, including, you know, at a point where President Roosevelt um, issued an executive order to, unfortunately, uh, imprison people of Japanese uh, descent. Uh, according to Art Simon, uh, his father protested. He wrote an opinion piece. He spoke on the radio about the fact that this was not okay. And of course, he, Art Simon's father, was canceled, you know, as we would say uh, in our culture, uh, including by the church, I should add. However, his dad stood by his words. What happened was that 65 years later, uh, when a memorial was uh, dedicated to uh, some of the uh, folks of Japanese descent who were uh, interned, there was also a tribute to Art Simon's father. It said, this I quote, in tribute to Reverend Martin Simon, he spoke in protest, his courage inspired others. So, you know, he talked about how uh, what his dad did set an example for him on the importance of having a voice, no matter how unpopular it may seem. I want to talk a bit about my, well, how are we doing on time? Uh, it's uh, maybe, let's say, a few minutes, okay. like uh, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. I can do three minutes, ten pages in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so when I worked at the World Food Program, um, I was deployed to northeastern Nigeria to work on the Four Famines Project. And basically, in 2017, uh, for, uh, three country, uh, four countries were, were deemed at the brink of famine or famine-like conditions. So Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, and South Sudan. I have to say that I cried every night because you know, my team and I were deployed to northeastern Nigeria. And I cried every night um, because I was just so moved by the stories of the people in the refugee camps, particularly the women and children who had been displaced uh, who basically were at, at our mercy, you know, sometimes they would talk to us thinking that we would give them more food, but we were actually just there, not as the distributors of the food, but we were there to gather their stories. And the purpose of us gathering their stories was to uh, then, you know, uh, send it to HQ. So from Northeastern Nigeria, we would find Wi-Fi, uh, and then we would send the stories, we would type them up, take the photos, send it to HQ, and then HQ headquarters in Rome would upload the stories and the photos into the app, the Share the Meal app, which is a, a technological app that the World Food Program utilized to bring attention around the issue of these four famines, to try to leverage funding uh, from everyday people uh, to support, to make sure that people uh, don't die. And I'm actually going to show you all some photos of uh, so the so this was uh, during the fourth time, and so these are some of the folks that we were able to interview. Uh, you see some young children there in the refugee camps. They're all displaced. Um, this is uh, a supplemental plumpy, which is like a peanut-based uh, kind of. Basically, the kids suck it, and it gives them more nutrients than they would get because of the fact that they've been malnourished. Um, and this is kind of how they're distributed. This woman has four children, and that 50 kg bag, she and her neighbors, three of her neighbors would divide the 50 kg bags, and that would have to carry them over for the whole month. So it could be a bag of rice, a bag of beans. Uh, and then that's me with some of my team members 
you know, you notice that, so the question I was asking was the quality of the rice, you know, my, my colleague was like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, people are hungry and you're talking about the quality of the rice. But I was harping over the quality of the rice because the rice was actually broken. And I was also complaining about, and when I say broken, like, you know, broken pieces of rice, you know, not the way that you would see rice when you buy it. And I was also complaining about the fact that the rice was actually on the, you see that it's on the map, but it's on the floor. And, I, you know, I was concerned about the uh, uh, food safety issues there. And then those are some of the women in line that we ended up interviewing. We interviewed about 100 uh, folks uh, to gather their stories. So they have to wait in line, uh, really hot uh, scenarios um, to get food. You see the oil and the, the bags of rice and beans. And then this is actually one of my colleagues. You know, one of the things that happens, you know, as a humanitarian worker is that you get really connected with the people that you serve. You know, uh, this baby, um, when her mom and her were in line to have her measured to make sure that she wasn't malnourished. Um, and so I think her mom had to use the restroom. So my colleague uh, was like, yeah, I'll hold her. And you could tell that she really connected with this baby. And this is another mom who, you know, she's waiting in line uh, to get food access. You'll notice when you, when you hear on the memes about trucks delivering food, and you sometimes you hear about trucks of food just sitting there and not going through, these are the trucks that are trying to get food to people. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you may have heard on the news of truck drivers complaining that, you know, food is just spoiling uh, because the food, the food is not being stored properly. Because trucks don't have the ability to store food the way that storage, uh, storage is good. And these are more photos of just women waiting in line. Um, now, the weather conditions were horrendous. It was very hot, uh, very dry. Uh, very, I was exhausted every single day uh, that we were out there talking to people. Uh, that's me interviewing uh, a mother and her daughter. And she actually spoke a little bit of English because um, I was speaking to her through my interpreter and colleague. And the reason why I'm highlighting this photo is because I admired her little daughter had a, a bangle. So I love bangles. And so I was like, Amina, I love your bangle. And then my colleague interpreted what I said to her, and she said, do you want me to make you one? And so just the, the, the generosity of people in need really moved me. And I felt bad, actually, because you know the last thing I wanted to do was make her feel that she had to do anything for me. The reason why I highlight this photo is because when my team and I went into the refugee camps, uh, you see the bags of food, so families will take turns on who actually gets the bag itself. So once you've shared the food, they use the bag to create shelter in their camp. So those, like these things that you see, those are like the bags of food that they creatively use to seal their homes. Um, but what's also remarkable about this story is this woman, you know, she is the same family in the photo. This photo is when we first went into the camp to ask them if they would talk to us. You can see that the kids do, did not want to do it. They're like, we don't want to do it. We don't, I don't want to be part of this. And the mother was smiling because she thought that we would give her more food, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, the defiance that you see, so this, this photo, if you go on Google search, this photo is actually part of the share the meal on the app that we utilize to uh, mobilize support for these families. But this photo is really reflective of the impact of food insecurity on children, where they just want to be kids. You know, they don't want their photos taken. They don't want to be part of anything. You know, and the only reason why they're doing it is because you know his mom told him to do it, and just the sorrow and you know. Uh, the heartache that they're feeling of having to be part of this. And then she became the face of the Share the Meal app. Um, so this is, so you don't see this, this is the final product that you see, but this is 
This is the young girl that we interviewed. She's 16 years old. As you see, she doesn't look her age. Um, her family were murdered, unfortunately, uh, by Boko Haram. And so basically, she was by herself uh, in the refugee camp. And her face is not clear because this is a picture that I took using my iPad because my photographer was using a better, you know, a better camera. But in this photo that I took, she's actually not smiling. I, it took us so, this smile that you see took us so long to make it happen because she just did not have the energy. She did not have the joy. She did not have the drive to smile. Uh, and she ended up being you know, the face of the Share the Meal uh, project. Um, so these are some of the countries that I mentioned where the four famines were happening. Um, and I want to pivot into hunger hotspots, which is my final sort of presentation to you all. Um, at Bread for the World, you know, we've been really looking at what we can do to address this issue of hunger. Uh, and I think I mentioned the hunger hotspots uh, report that the UN puts out. And as you see, these are some of the countries that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. There are 18 hunger hotspots that really covers 22 countries. And a lot of them are impacted by some of the issues that we all see on the news, whether it's conflict, whether it's climate. So you see the different delineations of the drivers of hunger uh, in the different countries. And so we decided to lift up the voices of uh, people who are impacted uh, by uh, hunger hotspots, in, in hunger hotspots, basically. And so um, in 2023, we were actually able to feature the voices of people who had been impacted uh, in hunger hotspots. So particularly, we highlighted folks from um, Burkina Faso, Mali, Kenya, Haiti, Honduras, Afghanistan, and the Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh. So that's what we did in 2023. Uh, and how did we do it? We brought them on as speakers uh, in our briefing series. It's a virtual briefing series. Some of them could not be on camera because it was a danger to them, because they were calling from their countries of origin. So we respected that, but we thought it was important to uh, bring those voices to the table to talk about the work that they're doing around hunger and what exactly the US government can do to help to address uh, the issue of hunger. And so for 2024, we plan on holding additional briefings featuring countries such as Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Djibouti, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Yemen, Syria, Palestine, Pakistan, North Korea, and other countries. And so for, for this year, so far, these are the countries that we're gonna be focusing on as far as our Hunger Hotspots briefing series. And again, um, Sudan and Gaza uh, will be partnering with different organizations, uh, Haiti, Guatemala, Somalia, Djibouti. And, and basically what we do is we bring the voices of the NGOs that are doing work in these hunger hotspots to hear about what it is that they're doing and what the US government can do to uh, help uh, move the needle to make sure that people have humanitarian access. That's our main thing. People have humanitarian access uh, to food and shelter. So I'm going to end, I promise, in 45 seconds. Uh, as has been uh, its history since 1974, uh, Bread for the World actually used um, the offering of letters, is what we call it. So, you know, the, if you remember the apostles in the Bible, wrote letters to one another. And so uh, the offering of letters uh, is usually to members of Congress. Uh, and our red grassroots leaders would uh, basically write their members of Congress a letter uh, and advocate for food policies that we care about. So I mentioned the US Farm Bill. We care very deeply, deeply about that. The Global Food Security Act is another piece of legislation that we care about. The Global Malnutrition Prevention and Treatment Act we also care about, uh, it's actually a piece of legislation that we helped draft and see signed into law uh, by President Biden. Uh, we believe in the power of citizen voices to make an impact. For example, if you join Bread for the World 
in our offering of letters to your members of Congress to pass good food policies, you are moving the needle for resources for current famines and hunger crises, such as the ones that you know, I spoke about uh, very briefly. Uh, so therefore, I urge you to not underestimate the power of your voice to persuade your policymakers to do the right thing. Also realize that your support actually inspires me. Um, I travel quite a bit, you know, try to talk to people about the work that we're doing. And the work is exhausting. I won't lie to you, it's exhausting. Uh, but we, I'm also encouraged uh, when I know that uh, there are people out there who care about the work that I'm doing. I get my energy knowing that people, you know, care about the work that we're doing. Uh, and so, you know, the solution is actually two, two-legged. That is, you have to get personally involved. There's no way about it, you know. And you know, we're we're not meant to do life alone in this world. You know, human beings are social beings. And then the other thing is, we can make change through policy. Uh, I am so grateful that under Brett's uh, leadership, uh, Reverend Eugene Cho, our managing director Heather Taylor, and our amazing and talented board of directors, uh, we continue to carry on the legacy of Brett's work. Um, you know, as we reflect, I know that I think folks are going on spring break, um, but as we reflect on, you know, the significance of Easter, spring break, Ramadan, um, in our various communities, uh, I would like to wrap my time up with you with the phrase of hope and conclude where we started uh, with the words of Amanda Gorman in The Hill We Climb. But there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. How brave are you to let your voice transform the lives of others? Will you let yourself be the light you wish to see in the life of others? Thank you all and blessings.